Hello and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, as usual, um, we encourage you to consider making a charity donation in lieu of registration free. The charities we support include Save Me, uh, Brian May's uh, Animal Charity, Shelter, The Housing Crisis and the Help Ukraine Go Fund Me. Um, there are other charities to support too on our website or please do make a donation to a charity of your choice. We're delighted this week um, to welcome Paul Morrison, the relatively recently uh, appointed chief executive of the Planning Inspectorate. Um, he's going to be interviewed in the second half of the show by Paul. Um, hello, Paul. Um, the more astute of you will will notice that in the second part of the interview, Paul's wearing a different coloured shirt and not on the train. That's because <laughs> um, in the second half of the show, um, I am on the train, much to everybody's amusement. Um and nearly missed my connection. So uh, we pre-recorded that interview a couple of days ago, and um, it's a cracker. We really hope you will enjoy it. Now, um, we have a new format for the first half of our show going forward this uh, this series. Starting today, we'll now have a news item alongside what will be now three uh, case reports. Uh, and what more apt uh, news item can there be for our debut piece than the latest turn of events in the seemingly never-ending neutrality saga. In our last episode, we discussed the proposed amendments to the levelling up bill, the LERB, which would have fixed the nutrient neutrality stalemate in England and allowed the estimated 100,000 plus homes currently held up by the issue to proceed. Well, a fortnight is a long time in politics. Um, having spent much of the last year telling everybody who would listen that the government wasn't doing enough to ensure that the planning system delivers much needed homes, Labour decided to vote against the amendments, uh, which would have delivered much-needed homes. Um, and as a result, uh, the amendments were voted down by a narrow majority of the House of Lords. Um, and because they were introduced at the late stage of the levelling up bill, um, they can't be reintroduced. So the stalemate continues for now, at least. What next, you might ask? Well, that would be a very good question if you did ask it. There's a range of potential options that may need to be considered, such as a new bespoke bill, uh, effectively repackaging the amendments into fresh legislation, possibly also dealing with other things. Um, Non-legislative solutions, um, but obviously anything non-legislative carries a judicial review um, risk and risk of uncertainty. Um, the CG Fry appeal suddenly got a lot more interesting um, because if allowed, that would uh, resolve, um, resolve at least discharge of conditions reserve matters. Uh, homes, which uh, I think is 44,000 is the latest best estimate of the 100,000 already have planning permission. So that would be a, a fix. And um, Labour's alternative. Uh, but the alternative that they suggested um, it, it is also involves amendments to the Habitats regulations, and, and it's the loosening of the Habitats regs, or perceived loosening, that led the environmental lobby to kick up a fuss, um, as well as being based on the premise of the fix, as they see it, will involve preoccupation conditions, prohibiting anyone from living in dwellings um, so they can be built and they can't be occupied uh, until the, as now, inchoate mitigation is secured. Um, I'd say it's at the very least questionable whether any right-minded developer or financer would go to all the cost of building a large development uh, at risk, putting shareholders' money if they're a PLC or in institution money if they're not, um, putting all that in risk, uh, taking on the cost of element when there remains uh, such considerable doubt, as things currently stand, as to whether and when they can be occupied. So it may be that this claimed solution of preoccupancy conditions is more theoretical than real. Anyway, if if all of that wasn't enough news, the Housing Minister, Rachel McLean, has been rather busy this week, hasn't she, Chris? Oh, if she has, she most certainly has. Goodness me. Thursday, she issues a letter to Spellform Council in Surrey intervening in their plan. They are proposing to withdraw it, and um, she's intervened, saying the Secretary of State will not allow them to withdraw it and wants to monitor the situation. Now, why is this so significant, Charlie? This is the first time in four years with all of these plans that have been delayed and postponed, 59 of them is the latest count from the land promoters and the, uh, and the HBF, and we've had four years of this. It was back in 2019, Robert Jendrick, remember him, Sasha? The, um, Robert Jendrick uh, intervened in the South Oxfordshire plan, which culminated in them saying, the Secretary of State saying, you're not having your £200 million infrastructure money uh, unless you get on and adopt the plan. 
And now we've got uh, Svelform. But what's really interesting is that that plan is delivering more houses than the standard method in a Greenbelt authority. The standard method is about 618. They're developing, uh, they're um, proposing more than that. There's 900 houses proposed to be released in the Greenbelt. Um, and uh, as a consequence, 618 a year is the standard method. They're, they're looking to deliver 629, 873 in the green belt. Um, you know, it's a plan that was prepared by the Conservatives that the independents who now control the council are trying to stop and the Liberal Democrats and the government saying, no, get on with your plan. But there it is, if you're interested, tiny authority wedged in on the west side of London, really. And... Um, they are prepared to meet their needs. And so the councillors intervened. And the final interesting fact is there it was intervened. The intervention was on the basis that they haven't had a plan since 2009. Rachel McLean says it's completely out of date, should have been replaced by now. Well, there are 20 other authorities that have older plans. So are we going to see letters to all of them? Um, and part of the reference to that is because they've got very high house price to income ratios. Well, that, that affects lots of areas. So what a fascinating development. Definitely a change of direction from the government, Charlie. Thanks, Chris. Well, um, they're at least providing us lots of material for our new news slot. <laughs> <laughs> and long may that continue, at least. Um, now, Chris, you're going to tell us um, briefly about the Leverhulme appeals next up. So over to you. How do I do justice to the decision of Katie McDonald, which is over 60 pages long, in the space of five minutes? Well, the answer is to just give you the outline and then this is absolutely essential reading for everybody. So Katie McDonald was faced with an appeal. This is a site for 290 dwellings in the Greenbelt, in Wirral. Wirral have not had a plan for a very long time. Look at that, 30% affordable housing, 10% self-build, lots of green infrastructure. But before we think it's interesting just for that, look at this. That wasn't the only appeal. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that there were two more appeals for sites in the green. But look, 92, some of them quite small, 50. But hang on, there's two more. Uh, we've got more appeals, one for 153, 120. And like a game show host, there's even more. Look, there's another two to come as well, 38 and then 80. Nearly 800 houses in the Greenbelt. Well, we've just been looking at that in Spellthorn, doing it through a local plan process. But here we've got an inspector considering seven Greenbelt appeals all in one go, all from the same landowner. The landowner owns a lot of the Greenbelt land on the Wirral, the Leverhulme Trust. They are actually part of Unilever um, and were responsible for building Port Sunlight, if you know that part of the world. I'm sure Paul does. And what a fantastic development that is. And basically, we are faced with an extraordinary situation where the Wirral Council have finally progressed their plan. These appeals are being determined, and they're determined at the same time. The examination has been progressing. These appeals are taking place. And why have they gone to appeal with all these sites? Because the council has not looked at any Greenbelt land. They've got a local plan which is entirely focused on regeneration, particularly in Birkenhead which is the east side of the Wirral. And um, what what this involves effectively is a massive set of appeals. Just I think we've got a plan of the sites, um, just so you can see. That's the Wirral, uh, Birkenhead on uh, the eastern side, the posher bit of the Wirral on uh, the western side. And you can see where all of those sites are and collectively they add up to 800. Now, the context of the appeal if we just go to paragraph six, is their outline applications, um, but they were opposed by the council and the Wirral Green Space Alliance, which received Rule 6 status, and they're an umbrella group, get this, representing 30 local community and environmental and heritage groups since 2018. So they've been fighting off uh, Greenbelt developments and Greenfield developments in that area. If we go forward uh, to paragraph 13, we see that the inspector herself introduced the concept of prematurity in her preliminary note. I don't know which parties raised this, but she raised that herself um, because the new local plan had been submitted for examination. 
and um, could be, she's saying at that point, be considered to be an advanced stage. And she returns to that matter a bit later. So her main issues, if we look at paragraph 14, uh, are that uh, it's all inappropriate developments. It's all on greenfield land. And then the first main issue is whether the cumulative effect, remember we've got seven appeals of the developments proposed, would be so significant that to grant planning permission would undermine the plan making process by predetermining decisions about the scale, location, or phasing of the new development in the central uh, at the central of the emerging plan. Now there are other issues, but I can't do justice to them. All about setting and landscape and so on. So what I just want to focus on is this prematurity issue, which the inspector had introduced as a preliminary issue. And if we go forward to um, her reasons and um, paragraph thirty five. What she observes is that the emerging local plan was submitted in October 2022. Examination hearings had commenced, but the council didn't have the resources to accommodate both the hearings and this inquiry. So part of the council's case on prematurity and um, prejudice to local plan was, look, we can't do all this. We can't do all these hearings and do the local plan examination or these inquiries and all the examination hearings. And so part of their case was to say... um, the examination had been delayed precisely because of the appeals. They were being done in two blocks, but a lot of the stuff that was meant to be covered in April was in fact delayed to September, which would be now and well after these appeal hearings were inquiries were heard. If we go forward to paragraph 36, she explains that matters relating to you know, what we know, the early stages of an examination, statutory procedures, legal matters, um, minerals, waste, and so on, geology had been heard, but matters relating to the strategy, in effect, the vision, the objectives, spatial strategy, spatial policies, will, will, will be heard in block two. They were programmed to be heard in the first block, but now they'll be heard later. And um, this is all relevant to her conclusions about it's premature because she says that these are issues that are relevant to the appeals, but they're also very much relevant to the examination of the local plan. Paragraph 37, she notes quite fairly the appellant's case, a main plank of their case, was the contention that the emerging local plan is fundamentally flawed. It's all focused on brownfield, it won't deliver greenfield, and it won't deliver that 30% affordable housing. And the term used was used in numerous proofs and primarily to the council strategy, housing numbers, viability. So the argument really the appellant was making was the emerging local plan was fundamentally flawed. And of course, you can imagine what the inspector thought of that. Well, maybe this is an issue that should be dealt with at the local plan examination. Paragraph 38, the inspector um, was addressing the test of prematurity. And here is her, sorry, Rob, here is her conclusion on that, having looked at paragraph 49 of the MPPF, deciding whether it was so substantial that it would undermine the plan making process, predetermine issues. Her, her view was that the planning system is plan led, plan should be prepared by local authorities, it's built on the foundation. And whilst the emerging local plan has been a long time coming, I mean that's you're not kidding. We're all we're all's plan is out of the arc. <laughs> it is a long, long time coming. But now they were getting on with it. And the strategy promoted by the council underpinned by evidence base was that there are no exceptional circumstances to release land in the green belt and so the inspector's point here if we go forward is to is to say well if that's the core strategy effectively for this new plan not to touch green belt then um then that is going to the heart of the plan and she says i accept the strategy remains to be tested in theory that could be fundamental flaws However, the place for that to be take place is at the emerging local plan. The appellant's case that the asserted fundamental flaws are reasons which weigh in favour of allowing the appeals are in themselves fundamentally flawed because these matters must be decided by the emerging local plan inspectors and to form any judgment now would in itself be premature. I mean, it, it's impeccable reasoning. It's difficult to argue that actually if you're saying as part of your case the plan is flawed, then the inspector is going to turn around, I suspect, and say, look, you know, if it is fundamentally flawed, argue this case at the local plan examination. Don't run it as an appeal. Uh, And if we go forward then, uh, what it says is essentially all roads in this appeal lead back to the emerging local plan, a matter referenced several times in the reasons below in the context of the collective scale and location of proposals, diametrically at odds with the emerging strategy. 
and um, the advanced stage of plan making because she reached the view that the plan was at an advanced stage and she says it would undermine prejudice and predetermined decisions about the location of new development that are central to the emerging local plan. The council's witness was um, correct in stating the dispersal of development to greenfield sites is the antithesis of the emerging local plan strategy of securing the generation and existing urban areas. So there we go, the antithesis of what the plan was doing, and the plan is in the middle of the examination hearings. Now, the council won. Congratulations to their team. We'll have a look at that list of uh, people in a minute. But equally, I would say that the appellants have achieved a great success, because if you look at the appeal decisions, the inspector has considered each of the proposals and I can't do justice to it now, but on a number of them, she identifies that they don't cause a lot of Greenbelt harm. They are very well contained, particularly Site B, and as a consequence of which, the appellants have successfully promoted a number of sites here with very, very few constraints. So if the emerging local plan is flawed, as they're suggesting, and the Brownfield development won't deliver as much as anticipated, it won't deliver the affordable housing, here are a set of very clear conclusions from Inspector about a number of sites which would be appropriate to put into that strategy. So if we turn to the appearances, very, very well done to John Barrett from uh, Paul's Chambers and, and his team. Um, you know, there's a lot of people there who work very hard on that and including planning officers there who will have spent a lot of time dealing with each of these cases. Well done to them. But equally, let's have a look at the appellant side. The appellant side well done to them because there's a number of sites that they've got some very positive findings on in respect of those um, those seven appeals. So really, congratulations to everybody. The council applied for costs in respect of each of the appeals and the inspector rejected all of those cost applications from the council. I haven't even begun to done, do justice to Katie McDonald's conclusions, but um, that is a read you definitely need to take to bed and read it just before bed. Thanks, Chris. And uh, as the son of a scouser, I can just about uh, get away with saying the developers in that case, they were asking, but they ain't going to be starting. Hey? <laughs> um, <laughs> and with that, Mary, over to Essex. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you all. I mean, this is, after all, our, our first show of the new series, is it not? I, I know we did a special, so can I just say... Cheers. I'm on the water in Wealdon. I'm doing a shout out for Wealdon because I've been doing an inquiry in Wealdon. So I'm now going to whisk you off to Dunmo, which the keen amongst you will realise is in Uttlesford. Now, there is another interesting local authority. So before we actually just get into the meat, and meat of the, the Dunmo decision, can I just remind you that Uttlesford have a 2005 local plan uh, Dunmo also have a 2016 neighbourhood plan, although most of this appeal site was outside of that um, plan area. Athelsford, you will recall, submitted a local plan for examination, and that local plan was the subject of hearings, and in particular, the local plan relied heavily on three garden communities, uh, Eastern Park, North Athelsford and west of Braintree. The examination w w was not successful. The inspectors wrote a letter uh, at the beginning of January 2020 in which they said to the council, we've got significant concerns in relation to soundness, all about the delivery of the, those three um, communities. In March 2020, the council decided to withdraw their plan. In 2021, a planning application was made for a greenfield site um, at Dunmo for a, a, between 1,000 and 1,200 dwellings and up to 21,500 square metres of C2 Class E and F development. So it was a residential-led mixed-use scheme. The application was refused in October 2021 and the Secretary of State recovered the appeal in 2022. The inquiry uh, sat in July, between July and September 2022. So we've got this greenfield unallocated site, no five-year housing land supply, and quite a few issues, including, for example, um, BMV 
in terms of agricultural land. It was all BMV. There were landscape impacts. There were, in particular, heritage harms. And the inspector had to undertake a 202, paragraph 202 balance. And the outcome of that was that the inspector was convinced that the public benefits um, outweighed the harm to heritage assets. And he found that there was clear and convincing justification for the heritage harm. So he went on accordingly to apply the tilted balance. And he found that the adverse impacts of allowing the scheme would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits that would accrue. And that was, you know, despite finding, as I say, um, harm in a number of areas. And I, I should also mention there was also what was described as less than ideal uh, sustainability um, characteristics with regard to travel. So there were quite a few um, issues with this, but nevertheless, he gave the market housing significant weight, affordable housing great weight, uh, and the other benefits moderate weight. And the Secretary of State accepted the uh, detailed recommendations from the inspector, uh, didn't disagree with anything the inspector had to say, uh, and granted the permission. And well done to Rupert Warren and his team, and commiserations to Tom Cosgrove and Claire Parry, who I'm sure did their case uh, very nicely. But um, there's, a, there's a lesson for us to learn that sometimes in the right circumstances, um, the fortune favors the brave. Thanks, Mary. And again, a theme there, isn't there, about the problems thrown up by um, old plans, um, both in terms of the letter uh, and the last two cases. Before we move on to Sasha, we were giggling because Paul sent us a message saying, given that we didn't do the introduction at the beginning and his interview is pre record he literally is going to be saying a thing live. And I said to Paul, do you want to just say something? No, it's a hologram. It's not. It, 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 it's actually AI, Paul. <laughs> it's nice to see you, if not hear you, Paul. Uh, last but not least, before we move to your pre-recorded interview uh, with uh, Paul, Sasha, over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Can I just say it's the most devastating piece of advocacy I've ever heard from Paul today. Um, yes, I'm going to take you into the High Court to discuss Section 73. I mean, Section 73, as we all know, is a really interesting part of the law, and I mean that genuinely. I'm not being ironic because, frankly, there's always this tension between the scope and nature of any subsequent applications and Section 70 read permissions. And this was a matter that troubled the High Court last week in relation to a solar farm and a solar farm that effectively, as you can see, a solar farm, well, you can't see because it's in the description of development, but it had a substation. This was before Mr Justice Morris. Now, the fundamental issue here, this relates to a 2017 consent, and the question that arose was the grant by Test Valley Borough Council of a sec Section 73 application that effectively allowed design changes to the original permission, which effectively removed the substation. Now, the question before the court effectively argued by the claimant was whether the Section 73 permission was ultra vires because it removed um, the substation and secondly whether the council failed to take into material consideration namely that change from the 2017 permission. Now the judge and I think this is very important for all of us in section 73s in future the judge held that there were two distinct restrictions for section 73 permissions to make them lawful. The first is must introduce a condition that effectively creates a conflict or is inconsistent with the terms of the original permission or its original conditions. And secondly, it mustn't fundamentally alter, and notice the wording, fundamentally alter the original permission. Now, the final point I want to end in, those of you who are eagle-eyed will note that there are proposed changes in LERB to Section 73 and a power to effectively allow non-substantial changes. So query in the future, where will non-substantial stand in the context of this decision? But it's a very interesting decision in relation to Section 73 and what is lawful and what isn't on such an application. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Sasha. Yes, another illustration of the difficulties around amending or varying applications given the limitation of 96A 
an imitation of 73 and Hillside, the combined force of those. There is going to be a section 73B if Lerb goes through. Whether that will be enough for Reigns to be seen. Now, we will now find out, um, A, what uh, Paul Morrison's got to say about his experiences so far at Pins, and B, whether Paul is just a pretty face. Um, so um, please enjoy our interview. Please excuse me for the fact that I was unavoidably on not one but two trains during the process. I hope it's not too much of a distraction. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. So, Paul Morrison, Chief Executive of the Planning Inspectorate, welcome to our, our, our little show. Uh, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to come on. Uh, so you've been in post best part of a year, I think about uh, just shy of 10 months. Uh, so your feet are well and truly under the table. Uh, and we've been trying to grab you since uh, you, you first decided to take up the job last Christmas. Um, you have an illustrious career before coming to PINS. You uh, were formerly Director of Homes for UK Ukraine uh, Task Force and uh, in the Department of leveling up um in which you had previously led planning reform um so that's uh, something which is close to the hearts of all of us but before that you've worked in a number of other government departments uh and uh, uh home office the foreign office the northern iris office even the food safety standards uh, agency and uh, the, your biography tells you were head of counter-terrorism so uh you, you're well suited for the planning inspectors and all the vagaries <laughs> and entertainment that we have in the planning world so welcome so can you tell me, to start off with, what does the job of Chief Executive of the Planning Inspectorate entail? So um, there's a boring uh, practical answer. I'm the accounting officer for the Planning Inspectorate. I have responsibility for the budget. I'm accountable to Parliament for that and its, uh, its delivery. But day-to-day, -day, what I do is uh, I set the strategy and direction with my executive team. I'm responsible for making sure that the, uh, the Inspectorate is delivering in a timely way, in a high quality way, um, and that we are delivering, you know, good value service for the taxpayer. Uh, so that's what the chief executive does, as opposed to a, a number of my other colleagues in the senior team in the inspectorate. Fantastic. And we always ask our guests at the very outset, where are they? Because we live in our virtual world. And what are they drinking? So I am at home in Bromley in uh, southeast London, um, and I'm drinking iron brew. My boy blurry screen and there's a reason why i'm drinking iron brew it is actually the drink i drink through the day um and it's connected to my scottish roots my dad was scottish um and the the, the particular reason that's relevant here is i would not exist without planning town planning development because my mum and dad my mum's english they met in scotland when my grandfather was the uh, chief architect on cumbernal the new town uh, oh, so uh, I have a family history and a connection, but it has left me with a taste for Ryan Brew. And, and a taste for planning, obviously. So that, that makes you uh, semi-planning royal planning royalty. So uh, very much welcome <laughs> to, uh, to to the planning inspectorate then. Um, so let me let me start with uh, a, 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 an issue in terms of process. Um, the, the world has been up and down in relation to the last few years, but PINs has still got one element in terms of how events are dealt with which in, involves some elements of uh, the virtual world. So how is PINs dealing with the world in a post-COVID world? So I think like like most organisations, there are bits of the COVID world that uh, accelerated things that were happening anyway, the greater use of you know, virtual uh, procedures. Obviously, as we've come out lockdown, we've come back into more of the old world. But I think what it's left us with is something that's hybrid and gives us a greater degree of uh, flexibility and allows us allows us to then I think we always will now I think you know we we've proven we can that there will be elements of, of, of the business that we do that will be online uh, but I think it will always also be hybrid uh, with uh, with the, the real life uh, engagement um, so that's that's where we find ourselves now yeah I mean it's it's interesting because one of the issues in terms of the virtual world is it tends to um, be more family friendly so therefore it's, it assists in terms of recruitment that, that an inspector presumably no longer has to ever uh, travel to just do a case management conference anywhere. Uh, I don't think we've ever got, we're ever going to see a non-virtual case management conference. Exactly. So they, those kind of things just lend themselves to it. I appreciate there will be other, you know, moments when it, it's not so well suited, and and uh, having that in person is right. But I think, yeah, I think you're completely right. That that's where we are now. And has that assisted uh, assisted in terms of recruitment of planning inspectors? I think we always had in the planning inspectorate the the advantage of that uh, that flexibility because you know while well, you see you know inspectors when they're in that in hearings or inquiries 
um, there's also a large part of their life which was always remote working. We were we were remote working before it was a thing. So it has always been a. I think it has always been an attraction. The flexibility that inspectors have, just when I speak to them uh, about one of the attractions of the role, is that there's a bit of you know we've lost a bit of our USP, and then now lots of other people are offering it. But I still think we do have we do have that greater flexibility uh, than some other professions, both you know right across the sector. Okay, um, there's an interesting coder in relation to recruitment to the planning inspectorate. We've we've seen it as uh, our professional organisation. Uh, this year, because the first year is the first year that the, the PIBA have invited retiring uh, inspectors to the uh, annual PIBA dinner. Uh, how do pins mark the retirements of long-serving inspectors? Is there a, an annual dinner or a gong or just a letter? So you know, there's there's an extent to which is up to the individuals. You know, different people want to to mark the events uh, in in different ways. Um, so we respect those wishes, and sometimes if they want to mark you know, it with colleagues and so on. Uh, I have to say, quite a lot do want to leave without fanfare, uh, a, you know, a farewell meal with teams. There is a an old fashioned thing that we have that inspectors have always been able to receive a commemorative tankard, and that still exists. And many love that, and many request it. So that's the kind of the, the more traditional, symbolic, if you want, uh, mark of uh, mark of retirement. But as I say, there isn't there isn't a, a set piece gala dinner. It, it very much uh, depends on the individual inspector. Okay, because so I was going to ask you a question with regard to appeal fees, but Charlie's going to ask you that uh, mm -hmm. from his role. Hopefully, we, he'll have stepped out of the train by that stage. So, uh, if he hasn't, then I'll, I'll ask you that later on. But, but one related issue: uh, the the inspectorate um, or some members of the inspectorate have been on strike uh, over the course of the last year. Um, how is the strike affecting um, the operations at the inspectorate, and is it likely to come to an end for any time soon? Well, obviously, you know, industrial action taken by the unions is is, in, is intended to be disruptive, and it's not just it's not just the strikes. It's also, you know, the work to rule that that some uh, inspectors in, uh, are pursuing. As to what the prospect of it is, a, a lot. Of, I mean, I, I have actually you know, really good relationships with the trade union side uh, in our organisation, and we are we are in constant conversation. I have to you know, respect the fact that as a you know as a, a senior civil servant dealing with uh, unions. A lot. There are. There is a lot going on at a national level. So my answer to your your question around what the prospects for it are, um, are you know, are highly tied up with with where the wider negotiations between government and unions are going. And I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, you know, speak for the unions at all. All I can say is that the the interactions I have locally uh, are are very positive. We keep working through it. If industrial action happens, then we'll. We'll keep having to, you know, take the steps to to do what we can to to minimise the disruption to the service that we're we're providing. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of inspectors at the front line, um, and indeed barristers at the front line, so um, inspectors are all too often, perhaps wrongly, um, portrayed in the media and by third parties, sometimes by politicians, um, as being technocrats um, imposing decisions upon locally democratically elected. Um, decision makers, rather than, as we see it, a crucial part of a planning system which allows decisions to be taken objectively on land use uh, uh, issues rather than more capriciously, perhaps, based on non-land use issues. Um, so help me with this. In a world of social media, how do we ensure or how do you ensure that the inspectors are viewed as being that objective decision maker Sorry, it's hilarious watching Charlie walking down a train. <laughs> Never ever fails to steal the, steal the limelight, even when somebody else is asking the questions. Um, how do you ensure that inspectors are perceived by the public in a world of social media where these um, the, uh, spun views are, are prevalent? I think part of it is about doing things like this and saying, you know, what I see as the truth every single you know, day of my professional life, which you've already just reflected, but they there is absolutely no sense that this is a you know a, a bunch of technocrats you know overruling local democracy. It's a really critical part of the uh, of the process. We are we are you know you mentioned social media. We are trying to be active in social media. So you may see Rich Schofield as the chief planning inspector or Graham you know, active out there. We don't we don't want to be there in a in a in a bunker. We want to be available. We want to be open, and we want to be talking to people. Where some of that oversteps the line, and really it's a kind of an unacceptable attack on an individual inspector, we, we are 
know, we're pretty robust there. You know, we will we will sometimes do that openly. We will certainly do it uh, behind the scenes. There is a truth, though, that sometimes you you have to take some of that criticism on the chin. Um, we we know our role constitutionally. We know it's important. We know it's going to be there uh, for a long time. You know, you can hear you can hear the political noise and and what politicians say, and you know, it's legitimate to to criticise us as it is equally legitimate for me to come here and say, kind of, I refute the underpinning uh, premise behind it, knowing knowing what I know about who the inspectors are and what they do and what their critical role is. So, so it's always been the case that inspectors um, are the people that make the decision. So it's not as if an inspector is told that you have to make a decision or in this authority, we're going to go down this particular route. It's always the inspector's decision. But, but help me with this. To what extent is there any sort of quality control checking in, in relation to inspectors to ensure, if you will, there's consistency of decision making or there's sense checking about the direction in which decisions are going? To, to what extent does that take place, Paul? It, it does. And that is, that's a really, really important part of Rich Schofield's role. Um, so we do have a quality assurance process. Um, Rich is on, in, in, the, in the process of reviewing that and really thinking around, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the reading and checking of, of things, whether that's, you know, w- whether we've got it, but we've got it quite, you know, proportionate, but I'm pretty confident it is. It's, it's quite rigorous. The other thing that we're, we're putting in place, we make sure there are feedback loops from peer review that where there are high, high court challenges or customer complaints, that feeds in then to the work that Rich is doing around inspector learning and development activity. Um, it might actually sometimes throw up stuff that we have to feed back to the department because it's it's kind of highlighting policy issues that that, that may be behind some of that. Um, we have to have that. We're always going to have to have that. No one's un- infallible in, in any organization. So that is a really key part of you know why you know what Rich does as the professional lead to kind of ensure that those professional standards are maintained. I should say is one of the things I've been really struck by as I've you know taken on the role. In fact, when I knew I got the job, a lot of people in the sector were contacting me and and saying, in what high regard, the quality of what inspectors, you know, what they do is you know you know how highly respected they are. For me, as a, as a chief executive, you asked me at the beginning, and I gave you a slightly dull answer as to what my job is. One of the things I would see, thinking around it, as the chief executive of this organisation that has led, you know, existed for 110 years and has the reputation that it has, an absolutely first part of that is absolutely what I need to do is make sure we do nothing to undermine that. But you know, if I leave with this, this uh, professional standing as it is, which I'm very confident about, then that is a key part of my success. I also, by the way, have to acknowledge that normally when I got that, uh, that implored it from people, there was a but, and the but tended less to be about the quality side and more about the consistent timeliness of, of what we do. So I, so I did hear that loud and clear, but the two for me, the consistent timeliness and the quality are, are, are of completely equal standing. So, so I'm intrigued to know to what extent is your experience leading on reforms for the department? How, how has that informed how you've approached your, your current role, if at all? No, it, it it has. It's it's a, it's it's interesting to see it now from both sides of the fence. You know, in the sense that there you are in the department and you're constructing policy, and now I'm in the position where I'm not responsible for the construction of policy, but I am responsible for the implementation of it. Um, and I've always I've spent my entire career doing a combination of policy and operational jobs, and I actually think it's a really important mix because I think it's really important that people running operations are attuned to the political context and the political sensitivities and that way you deliver your services in a way that achieves the political imperatives of the government of the day equally i think a policy person who understands what it means to deliver is really important so that the things that are coming forward and right across the the full range of changes that we know are coming what what we are and what i really want to do and what we we see as part of our role is is to be that point where we can share that perspective that frontline perspective as the department is constructing policy hopefully so that it it ensures that when when it comes through as far as possible it has reflected our reflections on on what's going to be operable uh, as, as well as as well as the kind of the the, the the finer details of the policy development thank you that, that that's that's interesting um uh, one, one final question i'm going to just run run two questions together if i may Pins has a wide remit. So it does CPOs, it does DCOs. I wish it did neighborhood plans. Um, it does even applications directly to it. Um, to what extent does this work out internally about how you deal with these disparate uh, responsibilities? 
And is there any lessons that you've learned from um, other um, uh, planning or planning uh, uh, inspectorates elsewhere in the Isles, like Amber Planola or the Scottish Planning Agency? Yeah. So um, the way the way that it works is that there's an that there's an extent to which the dynamic I described before about our ongoing dialogue with the department around what we might be being asked to deliver has to be us saying, well, okay, so that that's really, really important and we want to do it, but you know, here's here's the operational reality of it. When it when it actually comes to it though, um, one of my jobs, and this goes, you know, to a core thing that I'm responsible for is I need to look at what the resource is and look at what the demand is going to be on that resource. And as you say, it pulls us in a number of different directions. And it's really up to me and the senior team and, and Graham Stallwood and Rich and, uh, and others, Graham, the, the chief operating officer, to make judgments about how we, we allocate the resource to deliver what we need to deliver. So, for example, you know, there was a particular focus uh, previously on thinking about the resource that we needed to put into the to the you know the lower volume but higher value activities, you know, inquiries, hearings, and uh, uh, and applications, and so on. Actually, as we you know we've made some improvements there, and the resource has been coming in, we're now able to think actually we really need to focus on written reps where you know there there are higher volumes and and traditionally backlogs. So we make those decisions both in the business plan, but then kind of operationally, we are constantly looking and juggling and making sure the way that we allocate resource is you know is is the best that we can do with the finite capability and capacity that we have but is really trying trying to deliver all of the things that are being asked of us uh, and is there any lesson learning from other jurisdictions uh yeah sorry so yeah i i, I talk a lot uh, to our counterparts and not and not just in the uk also uh it, with with uh, our colleagues in ireland i i was up there in edinburgh and we yeah, we have every year we have a you know, we get together where me and all my counterparts, you know, sit around a table and and compare notes. It, it's really, really interesting. I, again, I, I saw all, all of them again at the, at the weekend at the uh, uh, at the, at the conference in in Oxford that uh, uh, I was really delighted to attend. And it is is fascinating. All the countries are obviously different. There is a different scale in them, but actually, sometimes, obviously, the other countries have. Small, they have smaller caseloads and therefore smaller inspectorate equivalents. But in that, you know, sometimes they're afforded the opportunities to do more innovation and think differently. Uh, and in those circumstances, I am I am very happy to you know have conversations with them and steal with pride. And we definitely we definitely learn from one another and, and cross pollinate. And that's a I'm really pleased with that. It's a really strong relationship. And as I say, for the British Isles, not not just the United Kingdom. That's that's good to hear. Mary, do you have a question for Paul? I, d I do actually, um, and I wanted to ask you what has surprised you most in your role. So, think think? it's funny because obviously I, I I knew all about well I thought I knew all about pins uh, from from working kind of on planning policy, but I don't think I truly had a pre an appreciation a for the range that Paul was just talking around around the full spectrum of things uh, that the inspector is responsible for. But I actually, I'd never been to an, an inquiry or a hearing. I'd never seen an mm -hmm. inspector in action. I've met inspectors and I've been really impressed by them, but I've been having kind of policy conversations. But actually to see that dynamic, to see in action how people are managing a room and all the different parties. And uh, I think I think it, it meant that I went from a, a very high regard for pins and inspectors uh, to something something more profound. I I, I don't think I had truly appreciated uh, to the value of the organisation and the people in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, did you have a question? Um, I would echo entirely the observation you made about the quality of the inspectors. So there's always going to be individual cases and you know things don't always go according to plan, but we all feel, I think, I speak for all of us, absolutely, that you know just extraordinary uh, dedicated uh, staff, really, inspectors, uh, and and everybody involved, but uh, just the level of intellectual rigor that's brought to the process and the effort they make, and I can see how the work to rule will be disruptive because I suspect a lot of inspectors put in a lot more time than the contractual hours actually to deliver what they do. My my question is just what you were talking about with the government there, because obviously the de this is an organ, if you like, an agency of the government, isn't it? And it's there to articulate the Secretary of State's policy and to to deal with that how do they communicate that with you how do you do you have meetings with the government and i don't mean what's the substance of those meetings i just mean how do how does the government 
ensure that you're doing what they want and they oversee it and they're you know they're happy that you're achieving what they want you to achieve so I have lots and lots of meetings, uh, particularly D, D Luck are our sponsor uh, department. So, you know, not the only department in, in Whitehall, obviously, uh, that we have that uh, engagement with, but uh, we have a very close relationship with D Luck, close in the right way. So, there are, you know, I'm an arm's length body, and there's a reason why I'm arm's length for certain things, and the independence of the decisions is really important. But then, in the kind of conversations we're having around, you know, delivery, it's a bit of a two-way conversation. So we want to assist with our expertise in order, as I in to describe the, the the interaction we have on the kind of construction of policy and, and informing it and giving that ground truth into the development of it. But on the flip side, they hold me to account. So every month, you know, I'm an accounting officer, but I'm an accounting officer who has basically had that delegated to me by the permanent secretary in the department. So uh, she she and her directors have regular meetings with me where I explain what performance is and uh, and they ultimately are the people who, who 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 decide whether I'm you know doing well and whether the business cases I make for what I need to deliver are are credible. And um, and I do have interaction with ministers. Um, so uh, they they take an interest. Um, they want to know what's happening on performance, and uh, I am I am held to account uh, by them uh, as well as as well as the officials in the department. And just quickly on the delivery side, I mean, obviously local plans, there's an issue about that. It's out of your hands if they don't progress, but they they presumably want to see, you know, delivery of local plans and, and housing or, as they say, employment. Do, are they interested in the delivery? Are they interested or do they want to understand, I should say, what delivery is being achieved by way of housing? Yes, they definitely do. And it is of interest, you know, it quite detailed interest they want to know the, the, the repeated questions i get you know is is are, am i you know are we in pins are, are we ready are we doing the right thing because we're one part of the system but you're right we're a, we're a critical part if we you know if, if we don't do it in the right way and we don't implement the policy right or we don't follow our process then you know we run the risk of becoming a bottleneck so they absolutely do take an interest and they want to know that not just on housing you know they've got a particular you know interest and focus on the you know the the, the applications and NSIPs process and you know, absolutely regularly they are they're asking and and keeping on top of what the performance of the in, inspector is oh thank you yeah it's interesting my former head of chambers the late Andrew Gilbart uh, used to say that the scrutinizing role of pins um, isn't in uh, isn't widely understood enough and it really is important for the proper operation of the system at local authority level to know that you've got that level of scrutiny um uh, it, it will be impossible for me to do justice for the comedy value of having watched our Mo Michael Portillo <laughs> of the, the planning bar for the last 20 minutes. So I won't endeavour to. Uh, I will leave this, though, um, that there's 18,000 or so planning appeals a year, and your operating costs are about 65 uh, million quid a year. So divide one by the other. That gives you that if you pay, if you charge three and a half grand for every appeal, that you would uh, be essentially a self-funding organisation. So I think that's a lead up to your question, Charlie. Does that help? Thanks, Paul. Yes, it does. Are you conspiring to so that I'm going to miss my train live on air? Uh, right. the, the end. Um, but uh, Paul, yes, uh, sorry for the distraction. It's normally bloody hell. There's <laughs> 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 <It's like laughs> the a spark. You're probably going to have to cut that out. Um, uh, there's a huge spark there. Paul, um, I must apologise for the, the distraction in the background. It's normally Paul who's travelling, but the first episode about 50 is actually at home. Um well, my, my question to you uh, relates to resources, which many would argue, certainly the public sector, is the number one issue facing um, uh, the planning sector at the moment. Now, it, some might think that there's an easy solution, which is to charge fees for appeals, obviously perhaps with exceptions for house builders and means testing. Um, planning applications are subject to fees that sometimes measure hundreds of thousands of pounds. What's your view? Is there a case um, for exercising the existing statutory power in private legislation, there needs to be secondary legislation, but exercising the statutory power to, to enable PINs to charge fees, which could be then redeployed to help meet the resources challenges, whether mandatory or potentially optional for a fast track system that would enable applicant appellants to choose their procedure, uh, which obviously they can't currently do, um, but the passport office does them. You can, you can pay extra and get a passport the same day. Um, why not enable developers 
uh, and others to pay extra and guarantee an inquiry at a time of their choice. Um, so I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on either mandatory or optional fast track appeal fees. Yeah. So in so far as it relates, so I've, I've, I've worked and I've run uh, operations that have been self-funding and have uh, have charged fees. You know, working in the Home Office a lot with with colleagues on the passport office, but also on the visa side. I mean, in terms of in terms of what it would actually mean practically to me as chief executive, in terms of the availability of funding to deliver services. To be honest, it you know, and by the way, there is no no decision, as you know, the kind of the the the, the, the statute and regulations exist that would uh, enable you to do it. It wouldn't actually make a practical difference in terms of the money available to me. So when I when I run these things, the, the way that the public sector works, that would be money into the exchequer, which would be cost recovery and would be the way it happens. It doesn't. What it wouldn't do is money that you know that I can then say, well, I've, I've got a load of extra cash out now, and now I can do a better service and deliver deliver differently and and better. So I think there's almost um, you know there are different things at play here. You know, I I I, I, I know where you're coming from with the question, and as I say, I have. Uh, I have operated in that cost recovery basis before with you know with dif differential service provided at, at, at different fee levels. It, it doesn't fundamentally, I don't think, change the money available. It is a different method of getting money uh, into the exchequer. And as I say, again, you know, uh, it, those are decisions that are kind of made above my pay grade, as it were, in, in the department as to whether they they do it. It is certainly it is it is a it is a model. It work it, it works in other parts of government, but at the moment. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't, I'm not aware, but you know, that's the direction. Uh, direction of travel. That, uh, thank think, you very much, indeed. The intricacies of public sector funding. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Charlie, and thank you very much indeed, Paul, for giving us your time. I know your diary is completely bonkers, um, and whilst this is a pre-recorded session, this is after hours, so it's, it's very much appreciated that, that you've given the time for us. Uh, Sasha sends his apologies. He's still stuck as inquiry, which is what, what happens now that we're out of the virtual world and into the real world, uh, as you probably gathered from Michael Portillo. Um, so thank you very much indeed for your time, Paul. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. And over thank to you, Paul. Paul. Thank you very much, Paul and Paul. Um, thank you to our audience. We'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye. Stay home, Charlie. Cheers. <laughs>